Well, hello, and thank you for joining us here at First Christian Church of Herrick for this recorded sermon from the 2nd of January, 2022. It's that time of year again, time when a lot of people will make their New Year's resolution, keep it for about a month maybe, and then fall short of what they really wanted to do. Granted, some people may make it through the year and accomplish their new goals, but we're going to look at today is moving forward, not starting over, not getting a do-over like we did when we were kids playing games, but moving forward from where we already are, just continuing on with our lives, continuing to improve our lives, continuing to glorify Christ and understand the love that he has for us. It's not about rules and regulations. It's about love and obligations. Obligations to somebody that we love and we want to do the best for. And somebody that loved us and did the best for us in dying on the cross. So let's get ready. Get your Bibles out and let's get started. Good morning and Happy New Year. People are moving into 2022 hesitantly, I think. I don't know. Let's go ahead and open up in prayer. Dear Lord God Almighty, we come before you right now. We thank you for this time together, first of all. We thank you for your word that helps us to understand who you are and build our relationship with you and understand your love for us. Lord, as we open up your word, as we read these passages, I ask that you open up our hearts and our minds that we can take these words in and make them part of who we are and live it out this next week, the next year, and just the rest of our lives, Lord. We thank you again for the love that you have for us. We thank you for your son that died on the cross for us. We pray all this in his name. Amen. Anybody setting a New Year's resolutions this year? No hands going up. Are you afraid to say you said them? Because you know in about a few more days or weeks or the end of this month, you'll break them all, right? And then we'll set them again next year. And It seems like a process that we just do over and over. Maybe it comes from playing kids' games. Do you ever remember that? I get a do-over. I, I, I wasn't ready for that pitch yet, so I get a do-over. That's not a strike. Do you remember doing that as a kid? Wasn't fair. Let's do this over. Hadn't changed when we grown up. I know we got a lot of golfers in here, right? So you know what a mulligan is? <laughs> if you have a bad shot, you get a mulligan. So, you know, basically that's your do-over. Every year, New Year's resolutions roll around. We want a do-over. We want to start back over. We want to try this again and see if we can make it longer than two weeks or three weeks or a month or maybe two months. Be honest, how many of you want to go back, not you, <laughs> how many of you want to go back to your childhood and start over again? Anybody want to do that? Come on, show of hands. Who wants to go back to their childhood and start your life over again? No? No takers? How many of you want to come back next Sunday and get baptized again and start your Christian life over again? No? Nobody wants to get re -bat We can fill up the baptistry. I'll fill it up and we'll just baptize. We'll just run it in like, you know, an assembly line. My first baptism that I ever did after I got baptized, we'll talk about my baptism here in a second but the first baptism I ever did I'm at a church that's running 1400 I'm brand new to trying to be a lay minister in a church of 1400 and they had a big Sunday where they were baptizing everybody and they gave me somebody that it was his seventh time to be baptized If you would ask me that today, that you've been baptized seven times and it didn't work the first six, I would say no. Back then, I really didn't know better, so I went ahead and baptized them. I was baptized twice, though. 
And I got the same answer from the pastor of the Lutheran Church when I told him I wanted to be baptized a second time. Why a second time? First time I was baptized, I had some water sprinkled on my head at about three weeks old. I really didn't know at three weeks old what I was doing. When I was called to ministry by God and he brought me here, I started studying. Most of you have heard this story before, but I started studying what baptism meant and knew it was my acceptance of Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, myself dedicating my life to him. I couldn't do that at three weeks old, so I did get baptized a second time. But I will not be baptized a third time. I am not going to start over like we do so many times. I'm going to continue moving forward. The thing about water baptisms, Paul talks about in Romans 5. You have these in your bulletins in the back if you want to follow along in the church pews or church Bibles, pew Bibles. If you have your own Bible, you can follow along. Romans 5, verses 18 through chapter 6, verse 7. See, sometimes these all don't just fit neatly in a chapter. We're the only ones that put chapters and numbers to them. Paul wrote this letter to the Romans. It was like a regular letter. But starting off in verse 18 in chapter 5, Paul says, So then, as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so through one act of righteousness there resulted justification of life to all men. Now he's talking about Adam when he sinned, And sin entered the world, the fall of mankind. Then he's talking about Christ and his act on the cross that gave us all eternal life for those of us that accept him. Verse 19, for as through one man's disobedience there were made sinners, many made sinners, even so through the obedience of one the many will be made righteous. The law came in so that the transgressions would increase. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that's where chapter 5 ends. The law was there to show us our sins. As we're going to find out later, the the, the Jewish leaders, the Jewish people, the religious people in Israel at the time seen the law as something they had to adhere to in order to obtain eternal life. Paul's saying, no. The sin is shown through the law. When you look at the law and this is what you're supposed to do, okay, I've not done that, so therefore I've sinned. It doesn't do anything for your eternal life. Christ did that through the cross. And it says that sin increased and grace abounded all the more. So he continues on in chapter 6. What shall we say then? Are we to continue to sin that grace may increase? Does that make God's grace even more abundant as we continue sinning? As we continue to break the law, as we continue to go against the law and see all our sins, okay, grace is going to abound even more, right? Paul asks that question. Of course, it's rhetorical because he answers it in chapter 2. He says, may it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the, to the, through the glory of the Father, so 
we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is free from sin. When we come to the waters of baptism, when we, I've always explained it to people, when we go down in the waters of baptism, that symbolizes our death with Christ on the cross. And I may joke around that we'll hold you down till the bubble stop coming up, but and kind of make it a little more real, but no. But when we come back up out of the water, when I raise you up out of the water, that's your resurrection to a new life. You just died to your sinful self going down. When you're raised up out of the water, you're in a new life, a new creation that serves God instead of serving sin. Instead of serving your own sinful, selfish desires, we're raised up to a new life. Christ loved us so much that he went through the torture that was on the cross. If you've ever seen the Passion of the Christ, you kind of get an idea what it might have been like. He endured that torture and he endured the wrath from the Father. The Father poured out all his wrath, all his judgment on sin that Christ took on because of his love for us. We identify with Christ's death and resurrection because we understand the relationship behind it, the love behind it. Similar to why we get married, not the same, but similar to why we get married. Paul talks in Galatians 2, verse 19 through 21. He says, For though the law, he says, For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness came through the law, then Christ died needlessly. I don't live by the law. I live by God. I understand what Christ did to me. I use the law to identify with what God would like me to do. But my righteousness comes through Christ. If it came through the law, why did Christ die on the cross? The law shows us our sin. Christ removes our sin. Paul's saying it's not all about following a set of rules. The law. What is it? It's a relationship. It's a relational process that we go through. Let me put it another way. As I said earlier, we're talking about marriage. It's kind of like marriage, similar to marriage. Do you get into a marriage because the law says you have to? Do you get married for legal reasons? What do you get married for? Anybody? Come on, anybody? <laughs> Why do you get married? It's about love. It's about relationship, right? Why do we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior? It's about love. It's about a relationship. It's not about a set of rules. It's not about somebody being over us to control us. It's about his love for us and our love for him. Similar to a marriage. 
Why do you think all four Gospels and Revelation talk about Jesus being a bridegroom? And those of us that know him and have accepted him as our Lord and Savior, we become the bride. You've probably heard this one before out of Matthew 25. It's a tale of the ten virgins, starting in verse 1. It says, Then the kingdom of heaven will be compared to ten virgins, who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the prudent took oil and flasks along with their lamps. Now while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight there was a shout, Behold the bridegroom, come out and meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the prudent, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, No, there will but not be enough oil for us and you. Go there will not go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they were going away to make the purchases, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Later, the other virgins along also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Then there's a warning in verse 13. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. You have the virgins that were prepared. The five virgins prepared. The other five weren't prepared. They were still living their own life. Not too concerned about the bridegroom coming. They were there. But they didn't have enough oil for their lamps. They had to go out and get some. While they were gone, the bridegroom came opened up the doors, let the five in, shut the doors. It's not about starting over, it's about continuing forward, moving forward, going on. If you've already accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, continue to live for him. Continue to do the things that you need to be doing towards him. Continue to make him the Lord of your life, the center of your life. Because I'll tell you what, things go a lot smoother. I'm not going to say you're not going to have any troubles, but they go a lot smoother when he's the center of your life. If you get COVID, okay, I got it. God's in control. If you're having hard financial times, okay, I know this, but God's got this. I'm going to continue putting it in his hands. I'm going to do what I need to do, but I'm going to put the rest in his hands. If you're having a bad time in a relationship, put it in God's hands. I'm going to do again what I need to be doing. We continue to move forward. We don't go back and start over. If you've been in a relationship or if somebody's had a relationship that you know about and they've had adultery in that relationship, can you go back and start that over again? Okay, I, want, I want to do over here. I'm sorry I spent some time with somebody else, but I want to do over. We're going to start over. It's not going to work. The Jewish people, like I said earlier, they had a very legalistic way of thinking, of following the law. This is what the law says. You've got to do this, 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 and this. And we look back at the Jewish people and think about that and all the rules they had to follow. And 
think, yeah, sure glad we don't have it that way, that we have all these rules we need to follow. All I need to do is accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, right? It's funny, though. People today still try to follow rules. Think when you get to heaven, you know, I, I, since I was a kid growing up in Sunday school, I've been to church all my life. I think I missed two days because I was sick. So God, you know, you need to let me into heaven because I came to church all those times. God, you know I've given 10% in my tithes all the time. Sometimes I've even went over that. So God, you need to let me in because of that. God, your word says I need to love my neighbor as myself. So I've always tried to do stuff for my neighbors to make sure they knew I loved them. So you need to let me in because I helped all my neighbors. I even loved my enemy once, so you need to let me in. You know, Solomon understood this. It's all meaningless. The rich young ruler, do you remember the story of the rich young ruler that came up to Jesus and asked what he needed to do to get into heaven? What do I need to do to secure eternal life? And Jesus went through a list of some of the laws. Now, I've done all those. Okay. Tell you what. Why don't you sell everything you have, take all that money, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. Jesus hit him where it hurt. Well, I can't do that. I've got a lot of money. I can't just give it up. That was his sticking point. He would have been one of the five virgins that didn't have enough oil on his lamp. Because he went away sad. And again, like I say, Solomon would have understood this. Solomon had all the money in the world. He had everything he could possibly want. And he called it all what? Meaningless. In Ecclesiastes, he calls it all meaningless. Meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. All this stuff is meaningless. It's not about the things we do, the things we have. The writer of Hebrews dealt with this confusion between the law and salvation through Christ. We don't know exactly who the writer of Hebrews was, but we do know that they were talking to the Jewish people. Hence, Hebrews. In chapter 6, starting in verse 1, they say, Therefore, leaving the elementary teachings about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, of instructions about washing and laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the power of the age to come and then have fallen away, it's impossible to renew them again to repent. Since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him open for shame. Hard statement. Hard passage. If I've truly accepted God into my heart and I've truly tasted the salvation that comes through him and I've truly understood the love that he has for me, and I give all that away, and I just go out to live my life anyway, knowing what I'm giving up, giving up eternal life, love of God. The writer of Hebrews says it's impossible to renew them again to repentance. 
comes down to that doctrine of once saved, always saved. I could debate that 12 different ways, but I'm not going to get into that. So when it comes to church, when we pay our tithes, when we love others the way Christ does us, when we do anything that God's word says we should be doing, do we do it out of a sense of obligation? Well, the Bible says I have to do this, so I, I have to do this. You know, I, I'm, the Old Testament tells me I'm supposed to give a tenth of my income to offering, to the tithes, to the church. So I do it, begrudgingly, but I do it, because the Bible tells me I'm supposed to. The Bible tells me I'm supposed to love my neighbor as myself. Okay, I have to follow the Bible, I do that. The Bible tells me I'm supposed to love my enemy. Anybody do that? Or is that the one you fall down on? Okay, I can't get into heaven because the Bible tells me I'm supposed to love my enemy and I just can't do it. Do you do it out of a sense of obligation? Or do we do it because of our love for Christ and his love for us? put Brandon on the spot here since Shannon's not even here. He can answer truthfully, right? (laughs) If Shannon asks you to do something, do you do it because you love her or do you do it out of a sense of obligation and you fear her? (laughs) Honestly, though, if if you really love any of us, if we really love our spouse and they ask us to do something, we, we try to do it out of a sense of love, don't we, because of our relationship with them? I love my wife. She asked me to do something. I'm going to do it. As long as it's within reason, of course, right? Christ asks us to do something. We don't do it out of a sense of obligation. We do it out of a sense of love for him and his love for us. He asks me to do something. Sure, I'll do it. No problem. You died for me on a cross. I can love my enemy. It's going to be tough, but I'm going to need your love and your strength to do it, but I know you can give that to me. So yes, I can love my enemy. Tithing to the church to keep your kingdom going, yeah, that's not a problem. Coming to church, even if it's cold outside, kind of see our fair weather crowd. (laughs) Coming to church is a sense of obligation because of our love for him. We want to be close to him. Not that he's not close to you there, but when we all come together as his body, wherever two or more are gathered, I'm there, right? We come to church because of our love for him and his love for us. So we keep moving forward. We don't start over. We don't, it's a new year. We're going to just reset everything and go back and start again. No, we're going to move forward. I don't care what 2021 brought us. I don't care if you had COVID back then or if you're afraid of getting COVID in 2022. We still move forward. Don't let the fear of everything hold us back. Don't let a sense of we need to restart, we need a do-over hold you back. We need to be building on what's already been established. And it's been established at the cross when he went and died for us because of his love for us. I'm going to pray here and the band can come back up. After I'm done praying, if anybody needs the prayer room, I'll be in there. If you need to sit down and talk about something, if you just need prayer for something, I'll be in here. If you've never given your life over to Christ, I'll be in there. I'm here for you, and I'm here to serve him. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Lord God Almighty, we come before you right now. 
Again, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the love that you have for us. We thank you for your son that died on the cross because of his love for us. So we live out a life now to glorify him because of that love that he had for us, the love that took him to a cross, the love that he died for. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, thank you so much for joining us here at First Christian Church of Herrick for this recorded sermon. I hope you got something out of this that will help you in your walk with Christ and continue to help you grow in Christ. Uh, As I said at the beginning, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns, or even prayer requests, I encourage you to contact us here at the church. Um, You can go to our webpage at www.fccherrick, that's H-E-R-R-I-C-K, Dot org, and you can leave messages there. It's also got our email on there. Uh, also our phone number, which is 618-428-5294. And you can call if you want and just leave a message. Um, but we got so many ways to get a hold of us. I just hope you take that opportunity if you feel the need and feel led. Um, but I'm going to continue to pray for everybody out there that listens to this, that this helps you grow closer to God. Take care. May God bless.